Do you think that there's a usefulness in having a, a nemesis to motivate you, talking about some of the situations that you've been through? Not particularly those ones exactly, but I try to avoid making enemies of people mm -hmm. or groups or ideas or whatever. Yes, don't make unnecessary enemies. But mm -hmm. there is an extra level of fire that gets lit underneath you when you're going up against someone, and I miss it sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's a price that you pay for peace. Yeah, well, then you just have to look at yourself harder and find the nemesis. Because it's there all the time, right? I mean, there's always parts of yourself that you can overcome. And so that's William James' moral equivalent to war, essentially. You know, if you need something to grapple with, and you probably do, you can find that. You just look inside, you'll find something to grapple with. You know, inadequacy, weakness, susceptibility to temptation, narcissism, pride, envy revenge, resentment, frustration, lack of faith, all of that, that, that'll keep you occupied if you really grapple with it. And yeah, I mean, that's an ancient theological question, you know, what's up with the devil? Why, why, is the, why does the possibility of evil exist? Why is there an eternal adversary? You see that reflected in Cain and Abel, right, at the beginning of the Genesis stories, essentially. The first two human beings are good set against an adversary, and that's, that's what opens history, that story. You think, well, why would God construct such a... Why would God, God construct a reality where an adversary exists? And maybe it's because all things considered, a world with an adversary is a better world, just like a garden with a snake in it is a better garden. These things aren't easy to understand. No, no snake, no necessity to contend with snakes. Right? So why be awake at all? No adversary, no challenge. Why be challenged? Because maybe you're better for the challenge. And maybe that's the challenge, to see if you can be better for the challenge. But that should be internal? Well, fundamentally, well, if it isn't, you'll find it externally, because you'll demonize someone to turn them into Satan so that you can find an adversary. And then that's very unfortunate for you and for them. That's and the it's problem. it's just not as big a battle. It's like you, you battle with someone external who's malevolent, let's say, or you think they are, and usually you've got that mostly wrong, but not always. But if the battle is inside, which is where it's supposed to be, fun most fundamentally, then, well, then it's the ultimate, ch it is the ultimate challenge. And that's the infinite game. Mm -hmm. The external one is... Battle isn't. between good and evil on a playing field of chaos and order. That's the eternal game. And, you know, you can play that out in the external world, but part of what the religious enterprise is about, and the Christians have really contributed to this, is the notion that that sacred battle is fundamentally spiritual, which is to say, in some sense, fundamentally psychological. It's to be, it's to be fought on the battleground of the soul, internally. It's a subjective issue. How do you defeat evil? You defeat the evil in your own heart. That's, that is how you do it. And so if that's all being acted out, for you in the world, well, you've, you've misplaced Satan. That's a good way of thinking about it. This is another weakness, I think, of the atheistic position, because you can, it's pretty hard, it's an easy in some sense to dispense with belief in the highest good, but it's not so easy to dispense with belief in evil. So that's a big problem. So then where do you localize it? And you can find evidence of it everywhere, certainly in institutions. I mean, that's the whole systemic racism, corrupt patriarchy narrative is that Satan is to be found at the core of our institutions. And to some degree, that's true. Because everything we do is corrupt to some degree. And so then do you fight it sociologically? It, you're the good person and the, the institution is Satan? So you're so good, are you? You're so sure of that, are you? You've got everything in order, or do you? And you might say, well, do you have to have everything in order before you fight evil on the sociological front? And the answer is, well, no, because you're never going to have everything in order, but you still shouldn't put the cart before the horse. It's really, it's a spiritual battle. And it's taken people thousands and thousands of years to figure this out. Now, first of all, it was the snake. What's, what's evil? What's malevolent? The predatory reptile. Fair enough, man. I mean, we've been fighting with predatory reptiles for 60 million years as mammals. 60 million years. So it's a good first-pass approximation. It's the snake, the poisonous snake, the external enemy, the predator. Well, what about the predator and other people? 
oh yeah, that's even worse, man. It's like how pred predators are one thing, but predatory people, other tribes, man, they're brutal, they're brutal. Oh, well, what about your predatory friend? Oh, that's pretty bad too. The friend who stabs you in the back, the person who betrays you, Judas, God, maybe that's the ultimate snake. It's like, well, how about when you betray yourself? Oh, yeah. Do you want to see there's this association that's very strange that occurred in the development of Christian thought between the snake in the Garden of Eden and Satan? There's no indication in the original story that the snake has anything to do with the Lord of all evil. It's a very weird conclusion that's been drawn. It's almost extra biblical because there's almost no mention of Satan in the Bible at all, much less any direct connection between the serpent and Satan. It's a very, very strange idea, but it's part of this psychologization of evil. Like, well, what's the ultimate predator? What's the ultimate predator? What's the enemy you harbor in your own heart who hates you?